Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. My name is Ben, I'm from Priori Data, and I'm going to be talking about mobile gaming market trends. I'm going to go through data from us that we have as a company, and also information that we have from partner companies, and also various stuff from the industry. I don't want it to be too prescriptive, so if you have questions or see something you think like, hey, that looks really whack, just sing out and uh, we can talk about it in the middle of the presentation, because rather than waiting right to the end. So first up, who's a Ben Nolan and what's a Priori Data? I have been working in mobile gaming for four years. I have started out uh, working directly with publishers, building up a data network alliance with developers who could share their data with us, which we could then use to build insights into the industry, which they would get in return, and more recently have been working on sort of more growth-oriented stuff. I play weird sports. This is underwater hockey here. <laughs> and uh, I have a crippling addiction to World of Warships. So I'm a bit of a gamer as well. Don't tell my girlfriend. She'll think that all of this hard work I've been doing late at night is not actually hard work. Priori Data is 20 people sitting in Berlin. Uh, we are a mobile market intelligence company. So what that means is we collect data from a lot of sources, from the app stores, from developers. We work with more than 2,000 developers, a lot of whom are actually here. I can see the guys from Huge, and I can see, I think, Vivid Games as well, who uh, have been working with us for a really long time. And the way that that works is it's a crowdsourced approach. So all of these companies contribute download and revenue information to us. We scrape the app stores and collect, connect those two data points together. So we can say, in the app store, in place one in the games category in Poland is app number X, and they're making this much downloads. And we take the next app, and maybe that's X minus 10%. And we take the third one, maybe that's x minus 20. And we can do regression analysis on that, which is what this looks like, to understand a relationship between a rank in the app stores and an amount of downloads or an amount of revenue, and more recently also uh, usage information as well. And a lot of different people use that information, but primarily for the game industry, it's for understanding competitor performance and understanding industries that you might want to go into. So if you're setting up a launch, you would look at this kind of data and say, how big is the market? Uh, how competitive is the market? Who would I need to beat? How many downloads would I need to drive? That kind of thing. So that's why we have access to this kind of market information that I want to present. So I've kind of gone through where the data comes from. But just briefly, if you see stuff that looks weird in the platform, this is my, why it might look weird. At the end of the day, we're only 15 people on the data, data, data and development team. So 15 people, you can't save the world with that. Um, and our models are designed to predict performance based on historical performance. So that means if an app is launched that looks like an app that's been launched before, we can predict the performance quite well. If you have a Super Mario run, which just completely broke the category that it was in, it's hard to estimate that accurately. So if you see some cases where you're like, that looks weird, that might be why. The other thing is China Android. Who here publishes on Android stores in China? One? Seriously? One? <laughs> OK, two, there we go. So it's pretty hard to track, because there are 36 or so relevant stores there, and then another 100 that are irrelevant. So that's sort of something we've sort of said, don't want to have anything to do with that right now. 15 people can't do that. Um, and the last point is according to our data. So we have this huge data set. It's not all of the devices in the world. So that means that some of, some of this data will have an inherent bias. You might notice it, you might not, but if you have questions, just ask. So. Market trends, what's going on in mobile right now? People still want games. Like There's sometimes this uh, media spin on things that the game industry is sort of starting to flatten out. But as you can see, this is a download trend over time globally per platform. We can see Google in blue. So it's actually, if you look at Apple on top, it's not really pr contributing very much. But uh, Google growth is pushing the whole thing gently upward over time. And what kind of games do people then want? Because obviously there are different trends that are going on, and there are some games that are less exciting now than they were, and some that are more exciting. So here we can see that Action Arcade and Puzzle on Google are really, oh, this is iOS, sorry, my bad. <laughs> um, on iOS are really driving the growth. And on Google Play, we've got Action Casual and Arcade as well. So kind of the typical games that you think of, Action being Obviously, Battle Royale at the moment is, is doing a lot there, but um, these are the kinds of categories that I think a lot of people are, are focused on anyway. So the other thing I wanted to, to dig into is what kind of games are not only big right now, 
but are growing compared to where they were. So what we're looking at here is percentage based growth in the, in the Google Play Store, which categories are really taking off at the moment and have much stronger period over period growth than other categories. So we can see the music category, the board game category, education category. These are categories that people have a demand for and that demand is growing over time. On iOS, a little bit of a different story. There's not as much growth. Now, this is relative growth. So that means that although you have a huge decline in the dice games category, because that was such a small category to start with, a big percentage decline means a small numbers decline. And other categories like the arcade game or role playing game categories are bigger. So a smaller percentage gain means a bigger number gain. So games that are trending, word games, arcade, role playing, simulation as well. But where's the money at? What are people actually looking to pay for? So the money in mobile in gaming is still on mobile. You can see here data from Newzoo. Uh, mobile share is growing and the whole the total is growing as well. So mobile is getting bigger. Main force for that is that consumers are learning to pay on mobile, not just in very specific game types, but in lots of different game types. And we're also learning how to monetize users without annoying them with ads all the time. So good video ads, rewarded video ads, for example, are helping there. So on iOS, where does the where does the money come from? RPG. Anyone surprised? Nope. <laughs> okay. Now tell me what's wrong with the next slide. Compare. Anyone? Where's action? Way down the charts. But the big difference here is you can see the RPG to action, the difference is almost nothing on iOS. But if we go to Google Play, where you are missing China effectively, there's a much bigger gap. And that's because the categories that are, the category difference there that you're missing in China makes a big difference. So it's important to think about when you're looking at this kind of data in any case, always think about China and what the effect of China is on that because it's really hard to estimate. You can't include it in this kind of thing, but you need to think about it because it has a big impact. So what game categories are people learning to pay for? So this is not talking about how much revenue game categories are making, but which categories are starting to drive revenue or have a bigger percentage growth in revenue. So here we can see that the casual games category, the word games category, it's actually quite funny. Yan, who knows Jan? Big Polish Jan? Yeah, so Polish Jan wrote me and was like, Ben, do you want to present? I was like, yeah, sure. And he said, I want to hear something about trends. Like, you know, word games are really hot. And I was like, I don't know, I haven't really heard about word games. Like, at least not in a, you don't hear about them as being the top trending games. You hear about, you know, Battle Royale and anything Supercell does. But then I was like, oh, okay. People are learning to pay for word games big time. So iOS, it's a very similar story. Nobody is really, like, there's not a lot of big growth there. This is one of those cases where I think the data looks a bit weird. But adventure games are driving huge growth on iOS. So this is, uh, this is stepping away from direct revenue data now and moving to Arpdal. And what I've done here is I've compared Arpdal to one another based on a relative basis. So we're looking at what do people pay for the most? And then relative to that, what else do they pay for a little bit less or a lot less? So the average revenue per daily active user on role playing games is very high. And then you can sort of see that it tails off. Now I appreciate this data is super uh, general. So if you have like a specific country or a specific uh, type of game you want to see, then you can let me know afterwards and we can chat about it. Um, but you can see that role playing arcade and casual are driving the highest Arpdel for Google Play. And for iOS, we can see that we have RPG, strategy, action, and card games. Any ideas why card games is so big here and it wasn't big on? Yes. Card games are huge in China, and when you don't have it on Google Play, you don't see it. So that's where the, where the massive spike in card games comes from here. What I've done here is then compared stickiness. So this is a metric that I don't know if everyone tracks, but we calculate it because it's part of the calculation process to get to DAUs. Um, but what we've got here is effectively what percentage of MAUs are also, are also DAUs. Or no, sorry, the other way around. Um, so we can see that on Google Play, it's around 15% for the, for the stronger categories and a little bit less on, on, the, on the other categories. So card games, racing games, casino games, they have the highest percentage of users who are effectively very loyal. Um, and that loyalty goes down across other categories. And we'll see that on iOS, in general, 
at least in the data set that we have, which is based on 3 billion devices, iOS users are more loyal than Google Play users. It's still not sticking around that long. We can see it's around 20% of users are both DAU and MAUs, but in general, it's quite a bit more than on Google Play. And what I've done here is, and I'm sure there's data scientists in the room or people that play with data more than I do that will say, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> but what I've done is I've created a, a category difficulty score. And the way that I did that was combined um, how big a market is and how controlled the top 25 apps in the market are. So what percentage of the total market in a particular category do the top 25 control? So if you have a market uh, that has, I don't know, Clash Royale at the top, and it controls 30% of the total downloads of a category, then it's going to be very hard to compete in that category. So what I've done here is combined for the, the difficulty, how big a category is, how expensive it is to acquire users in that category, um, and how condensed the top, top of the market is in that category, and then contrasted it with the average revenue per user and the, the revenue market size uh, to get an opportunity score. So what we can see is that on Google Play, a lot of the categories are relatively harder to win in. They have a lower revenue per user, they have a not low enough uh, acquisition cost, and they're more concentrated. So, or those are the factors that are playing in there. And what we can see is that iOS generally tends to be a little bit nicer. I guess it's because the, the users are worth a little bit more when you do acquire them. And we can see that RPG is uh, kind of far and away the most rewarding category in terms of low concentration, high value per user, and high revenue market size. Now, you could probably put a lot of different stuff in this and hope people have ideas about what you could do with it, but you could also put in costs to develop different types of games um, to add into the difficulty score, or um, ad revenue, for example, would be another one that would make a lot of sense. So I appreciate that that part of the presentation is all very general, global level data. If you have questions or if you want to have a look at specific stuff, just come find me and we can, we can open up the real little stuff. So that kind of concludes the market stuff from Priori Data, and the rest will be more industry-level stuff that we've seen working together with our publisher partners or with partner firms. So industry and genre trends, hot or not, kind of thing. One thing that we've really seen, and I, I guess uh, a lot of US developers would have seen this as well, high-end devices are popping up much more. And that means that there is an opportunity to develop much higher-end games. Part of the reason for that is that technology is just getting cheaper, so you can build better devices. And the other part of that is that you have companies like Xiaomi or um, uh, OnePlus who have very powerful, cheap devices. So you can get those kind of semi-AAA experiences on mobile, which were not really possible at the scale you would need it to be possible to be feasible two or three years ago. What does that uh, sort of push towards? Esports. If you have high-end technology, if you have lots of people with high-end technology, you can do esports. Um, this is data again from Yuzu. You can see the, the growth of people who are uh, participating in, in esports, so viewers. This is crazy. Uh, like if you look at this kind of growth, we, we haven't seen this kind of growth in the ecosystem for a long time. So this represents, I think, a huge opportunity for people who can, can tap into it. Um, we can see that Twitch, for example, uh, is, is doing slow but uh, pretty, pretty solid growth over time. This is daily downloads over time. Uh, for both Twitch apps, and I think um, we had a, a big discussion about it last night, but uh, why brands are sort of skipping mobile a little bit. Like if you look at someone like Nike, they've done sort of an average job on on mobile in general, and now they're going super hard on esports because they say, hey, we missed the kind of the bus with mobile, um, but esports is something that we can get into now, and they can sort of understand a little bit more having sponsored sort of traditional sports, how esports works. So next trend, sort of also driven a little bit by the esports, Battle Royale. Um, a lot of people talking about it. When PUBG launched on mobile, they, a lot, we had a lot of people uh, from our investor client set coming to us and saying, hey, how do we get into this? This is like a huge trend. What's going on? The thing is, it's not really a huge trend. The, like Consumers love it. Um, but what I've done here is I've searched our database, which is 5 million apps. You can see we're looking in April. We're looking on for uh, downloads. We're looking globally, and we're looking for the keyword Battle Royale. So there's just not that many apps. 186 apps that have driven more than 10,000 downloads. You kind of need a lot of downloads to have a Battle Royale app that works. Um, you can see that three games, or two titles even, control 60% uh, of the market. So it's cool. People love it, but uh, it doesn't seem like it's really a trend that has 
worked for developers. Uh, ARVR is another one which I, I sort of feel is in the same boat. We had news recently of just ridiculous investments going in, crazy money is, is hitting the floor, but uh, yeah, again, whole bunch of apps, tiny market. So people are, people are building it, but uh, I'm not sure that as many people are playing it as, as, as would be warranted by that kind of an investment. So that's sort of on the, on the new technology or the new market stuff. Um, what's going on with technology? One thing I've heard a lot about recently is blockchain. Um, I don't know, if, has anyone experimented with blockchain in their games yet? No? So this is uh, a company called Alto. They're from, or the guy's from Hong Kong originally. He's in Vancouver now. And what they're building is sort of a, um, let's say you have an RPG and you, you get a big sword. And what they're doing is they're putting that sword on the blockchain and saying, okay, you are the, now the owner of that sword. You've earned it. And you can take that sword to other games. So what they're trying to do is build a, a marketplace where um, you have persistent items across games. And the pitch there is that it becomes then, uh, I don't know, let's say, let's say you're huge games. Um, or maybe not huge games, that's probably a bad example, sorry. <laughs> maybe vivid games, and you've got your boxing gloves. And you, get, you win the boxing gloves from the game, they get put on the blockchain, you can take those and port them across to, let's say, Fortnite. And you can play with your boxing gloves in Fortnite. And I think the concept there is that you can get uh, customer acquisition through items that you port into your games. So. I don't know what it's going to do, but I think it's an interesting concept. Um, there's also another company here that's doing some blockchain stuff with influencers, but uh, yeah, it sounds like it's not something that everyone's playing with just yet. Something else we've seen a lot of lately is on the marketing side, lookalikes. How many people run Facebook lookalikes? Yeah, just lots of people. Uh, how many people run lookalikes off of Facebook? Okay, no one? One? Um, so what we've seen a lot of lately is lookalikes coming off of Facebook. People saying, okay, that's really expensive. Uh, it kind of limits your reach. Um, it limits the scope because you just, you can't afford it. Uh, let's do lookalikes outside of Facebook. So let's say um, we know that our paying users, we can t t take a segment of our paying users and pass them to somebody like Kachava. Kachava can say, okay, they look like all of these other users. Maybe they don't have the same scope as Facebook, but they can do it a lot cheaper. And they'll let you pass those IDs directly to, to your ad network. So you can buy someone that has, for example, a uh, five games that are the same on their device are, uh, that is on your best paying user's device. And you can say, okay, well, this is, this is like a high indication of someone that's going to be a good user for me. We're also doing it. Um, not quite as sexy as Kachava does it, but it's pretty interesting to be able to check out as well. So what we're looking at here is, say, Bitmango's Word Cookies. What are the top 50 apps also used by these users? Now, you could also break this down by a category and say, okay, I want to understand that for a specific game, um, what other games are being used so I can target on those games or I could target on things that are not necessarily game related like okay I know that people that are a little bit older are more profitable for me so I'm going to target people who have uh, Runtastic and Strava or something like that installed that indicates the demographic that you want. Uh, another thing that I think is, is super interesting, is anyone on Hatch? No? One? Sort of? Trying it? What's the experience so far? Yeah. I, okay, I also don't have a strong opinion yet, but I, I really like the concept. Um, for those who don't know what it is, it's basically a, a Netflix for, for premium games. Um, and the reason I think it's a little bit exciting is especially in emerging markets like India or parts of Asia where you don't have the capacity on your phone to have a whole stack of premium games because they're usually big files. Uh, what you can do is you can stream that. You have a usually a good Wi-Fi connection and the phones are sometimes reasonably high powered but the, the memory is still very low so you can't have stacks of games um, and that's why I think this concept of being able to stream games uh, is quite interesting and especially like just getting your apps or games seen by audiences where you maybe would otherwise have a difficult time doing it. Google Play is also doing uh, instant games. Anyone trying that? No? So that's a, a setup where basically you can search for something and Google will throw you uh, sort of the first two levels over via a stream. So rather than you having to download the app and saying, oh, do, do I like it, do I not like it? You can stream the first two levels of the app or stream uh, sort of a, a mini game related to the game, um, which gives you kind of a soft entry into, into a, a new user. I'm not sure how effective that's going to be. I'd love to hear how people are, are using it or um, why people aren't using it yet. Um, 
but I think that's going to be a really interesting channel for people going forward. So business and operational trends. This one is, uh, like, feel free to sing out if you have a different opinion here. This is just what I've seen. But uh, I feel like people are getting to the point now where they're realizing that you can't just throw a game out there. Like, there needs to be a plan. Because a launch looks like this. This is actually a really, a really successful game from a couple of dudes that uh, are in Helsinki. Um, as you can see, they, they had a launch. They got featured, did around uh, 200k downloads a day. Pretty solid for a two-man shop. Um, but then, blah, not a lot. Um, so. I think people are getting the idea that they need to have a plan. Excuse the ugly uh, picture here. This is like a beta thing that we're doing, um, we're mapping uh, app updates. So you can see when they're pushing new content, so it's per market. Um, and you can see that they've had a plan to push new content consistently. And you can see in a couple of uh, cases here, they've actually had features based on that. So I think we're getting past, or that like the trend is, to, is that developers are understanding um, it's not enough to just push a game. You need to have a content plan post-launch, which sort of goes towards the direction of understanding what you're doing. Like uh, from a from a more data-driven perspective, it's not enough just to come out and I'm going to build a game, push the game out there, and uh, and that's good. Like that's just seems to be a case of where we're not having those kind of successes anymore. It's like when was the last time you saw a Flappy Bird? Quite a while ago, I guess. Um, but the data you need is getting easier to find. Like I thought this was uh, pretty amazing. Um, Google is opening up a whole bunch of new tools in the in the developer console. So they're going to put in user acquisition stuff. They're going to put in much more around revenue. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen the beta of this yet, but it looks really powerful. And for some companies like us, it is a really great opportunity because we'll get more data, but also pretty scary because Google's now giving away a lot of the stuff that people pay us for. <laughs> um, but hey, I, I think it's a, a huge opportunity to be able to get access to that information, especially for smaller teams who can't afford to buy that kind of information, being able to track that at least on your own app and get some benchmarks uh, is going to be really cool. Um, the other thing that I think in terms of data is becoming a bit more of a trend, this is actually from an app company, which is a bit weird. Normally when I talk to app companies, I tell them about gaming companies because you guys are always so much further ahead with data than they are. But um, this is a, a random forest analysis of feature use, uh, usefulness. And I think a couple of years ago, doing this kind of machine learning um, uh, work on, on data would not have really been that feasible. Um, but the tools are there now, um, particularly from Google and Amazon, that you can basically push data and, and do this kind of stuff at a relatively low cost. And I think the trend is definitely moving towards using this kind of data in a, like a, in a pretty sophisticated way, and it's not enough just to Excel spreadsheet anymore. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the, the guy from RuneScape talk before. Like I, was like, I looked at that and I was like, holy shit, like, <laughs> this is some hardcore stuff. Um, and I think this is just going to be how things goes forward as well. Another thing that I think is super interesting is the ad-supported stuff. Has anyone seen this article from uh, Space App Games? They're talking about um, their, their new launch, Fastlane. It's kind of like an old school shooter. And what amazed me was you can see here in orange the like, IAP bookings and blue in the, the ad bookings and then DAU over the top. And you can see that uh, they started working with an exclusive partnership with Unity uh, for the ads. And you can see that their ad Arpdal just kind of went crazy. Like, I don't know, does anyone else have numbers that look like that? No? That's, uh, I think that's probably the, the most aggressive like ad IAP split that I've seen. And um, I think it's pretty amazing. I think part of the reason we're at a stage where we can do that is because we don't have to show shit ads anymore. Like, you have good video ad opportunities, and consumers are starting to get the fact that interacting with an ad is not necessarily something annoying. I mean, everyone grows up with TV, right? Like, you, you're used to interacting with, with ads, and uh, they don't have to be annoying. And I think in this case particularly, they, they put the ad right afterwards, and it's an option to interact, but it gives you a big benefit. So being able to do that um, really allows, when you're designing games, to build that idea in from the start, rather than having ad implementation later. Um, into the core loop of the game, and it seems to work really well. I think they were saying, um, where was it? I've lost it, but read the article, it's super good. Um, this is sort of going back to the point around consumers and getting more used to, uh, to having ads and having a, like this trade-off for, I'm watching ads, so I'm getting a good experience with the game. Um, 
we talked to Rovio after, after they had that crazy turnaround year. And Willem was like, we basically stopped doing everything that was like not provable revenue and we focused completely on live ops. We, we started building really consistent engagement mechanisms with the games. Um, and that's something else that Space Ape, the, the guys with the fast lane game before, are really, really good at. Um, live ops is, is not something you build in afterwards, it's something you build in as a core loop. And in keeping that content going, like we saw with the, the chart from the guys from uh, Helsinki, it's keeping the updates coming, it's keeping the content coming. Um, I think this is something that is a little bit like, I don't know, do people, people feel like this information is out there around how to do live ops well? Yes, no, not really. So I kind of had the same feeling and I feel like we, as an industry, are getting better at it um, and it's, it's slowly coming. Like I think it's really cool that, that Space Ape are publishing this stuff on their website um, or on YouTube and uh, I think especially with the rise of publishers being, you know, anyone who's had a really great game seems to also be open to publishing now. Like, uh, and I think that means it's it's more feasible to get out there and get a, make a great game and and get help to build it, um, where it maybe wasn't before. So uh, one that's sort of like the last point that I thought was was interesting in in sort of ter the terms of industry trend. Um, the industry is maturing. There are lots of companies out there that have had big successes now and are now like even looking through the matchmaking tool for this. There were lots of people. There were quite a few uh, companies saying, "Hey, we launched this great game. We're now looking to for other other games to maybe guide or invest in." Um, which I thought was an interesting trend compared to trying to go and make a second really great game. So I think that's uh, interesting in the industry to see that there's sort of more push towards, okay, we've done it once well, and we're going to help share that knowledge and, and build someone else's game into a pretty big success. I think another feature of that is that this outside capital games as an asset class is sort of starting to happen. Like we have now uh, investors on our platform who are tracking uh, big gaming companies as, as an interesting investment, like so small cap equity investors tracking gaming companies to understand what's the performance. So I think we're seeing a rise in that from our side and, and I think that means that um, games are being legitimized as, as an investment and that means there's more money coming in to build games. Um, and I think the last point there that helps that, that sort of point is that people are spending more, companies are spending more on brand advertising. Um, so there's more reason to build or more funds in the, in the whole ecosystem. Um, like we saw with the chart from Nuzu at the start, uh, there's more money coming in and that means there's more opportunity to build games. Uh, what does all that mean? So this is a little bit like a, I thought I would have a, a much less experienced audience than the people I see here, so I feel a little bit bad about putting this up here. But um, what does this actually mean? I think, at least from my perspective, it seems like we're in a really cool position as a, as a games industry. Um, consumer demand is going up. Consumer willingness to pay for stuff is going up. Um, we're getting better at sharing knowledge. There's, there's publishers out there that are willing to help you. Um, and even though the industry is competitive and sort of Apple and Google are difficult to deal with sometimes, there are other stores out there. There are other ways to get to those people. And I think that means that there's a pretty big opportunity for the games industry going forward. And that's all I wanted to say. <laughs>